For a year and a half, I've been trying to figure out Unreal Engine. Ever since I saw the Quixel Rebirth trailer that blew everyone's minds, I knew I had to figure out this program. And over the last year and a half, I dabbled in Unreal Engine, but yielded just okay results. I wasn't happy with the progress I made, and ultimately just stuck to my go-to 3D program, left wondering how people got beautiful results like this. But recently, I felt something click with my latest project. So I'm here to fast track your Unreal Engine progress by breaking down my latest project and sharing everything I know in this one video to help my past self and everyone else asking, how do I just make awesome art in Unreal Engine? Now, before we begin, I have to mention there's no way I would have gotten this far in my Unreal Engine journey if it weren't for the help of great teachers and friends, starting with Steve Began, who took a couple hours out of every Friday morning to answer my questions, Jonathan Winbush, who somehow has a tutorial ready for every Unreal question I ask, Sam at Rococo, who picked up the phone every time I called to help troubleshoot, and recently, William Falchet, whose tutorials have been a godsend during this project. I've linked these artist pages below because if you're trying to dive deep in Unreal Engine or even just understand what this hype's all about, they got you covered. And finally, to Epic Games for sponsoring this video, which is about the coolest freaking thing to happen to a video like this. Unreal Engine is free to download, so if you want to follow along, click the link in the description to get your download going right now. Waste no time, then watch this video again to test all this stuff out. It's a blast. So without further ado, let's make some awesome art. These images were made as a tribute to the late ambient artist Mount Shrine for his posthumous collab album with musician Sky Too High. The full 10 minute music video will drop later this month in honor of Caesar, whose work skyrocketed the bar for ambient music for me personally. Now, music is actually my number one way to generate visuals, so the first thing I did was listen to their album Imaginary Pathways, which I've linked below. It inspired images of nightlife, flashing lights, and even old 90s video games. So I gathered references, compiled them in PRF, and used them to create this custom concept frame. I love this workflow because it efficiently guides me towards my project-specific goals. So let's hop into Unreal Engine and turn this rough concept into a cinematic scene. Optimizing your Unreal Engine project to look as good as possible actually starts from this point, the new project window. Each one of these templates toggles certain in-engine settings on or off depending on what you're trying to do. They can be switched back on later, so no worries. I'll, I'll walk you through everything, starting with enabling ray tracing. And if you have an RTX card that supports ray tracing and your computer can handle it, then this is a no-brainer. It's the best way to ensure you're getting the nicest results from Unreal Engine. Let's enable starter content too, which starts us off with some objects and materials to make life easier. Let's open our project and ensure that ray tracing is set up properly by navigating to Edit, Project Settings. Type ray tracing into the search bar and confirm the ray tracing box is checked halfway there. If you go to Platform, Windows, you must ensure DirectX 12 is chosen with the DirectX 11 and 12 box checked. You'll be wondering why ray tracing isn't working properly like I was if these steps aren't followed. In order for us to optimize our settings and yield the best cinematic results, we need to begin with a lit scene to point a camera at. So let's start building. Drag out a floor object from our starter content folder. Navigate your space by holding right click and pressing either W, A, S, or D, just like you're in a PC game. Q and E will raise and lower the camera while pressing F snaps your viewport to any selected object. Now this slider at the top right of your viewport that controls your movement sensitivity, while the options to the left toggle snapping for position, scale, and rotation. Let's grab some more walls and basic shapes from the Place Actors window. Hold Alt to duplicate things until you have what you're going for. And be sure to organize everything in your world outliner. It can get really messy really quick. It's very important you organize your stuff. Now I always use a human-sized figure for scale when building things out at first. You can grab that for free, along with a ton of other assets and full demo scenes from the Unreal Marketplace. It's a great way to reverse engineer beautiful scenes and learn through experimentation. Once you check out, you can add the asset to your scene, and bam, we got a character for size reference. At this point, things are getting a little dark, so let's grab a couple spotlights to backlight our stand-in DJs with. Now, color and intensity, pretty self-explanatory, but attenuation radius, that's used to control how far the light travels. You can change the inner and outer cone length for different looks as well. But I want to add a custom light fixture. So I made this in Cinema 4D, brought it into Unreal Engine, and used an emissive material on the bulbs to give a techie look to the scene. 
And since I'm using a handful of emissive materials in this scene, let me show you how to set up a simple light emitting material with color and intensity sliders. Let's right click in the content browser and create a new materials folder. Inside, we'll right click to make a new master material, which I'll name MM Emissive Light. Right click that and create a material instance titled MI Emissive Light. So the material instance is what will apply to objects in our scene to keep performance up and load times during adjustments down, as opposed to applying the master material to everything, which takes way longer to process, make changes to ultimately slowing down your scene. But we got to build the master material first in order to easily edit material instances. So let's double click the emissive light master material to hop in. And already this window might look familiar to anyone who's made a material before in Blender or Octane or Redshift. We're going to plug different nodes into their respective channels, starting with a color value. So hold three and left click in the empty space to create a constant three vector, which is just an RGB value. Now in order for this node to show up in our material instance, we need to promote it to a parameter. Parameters are the things you can adjust in the material instance. If I don't promote this to a parameter, I'll have to open this master material up every time, hit save, and it'll take like five seconds, which is way too long. So let's name it color. To control intensity, let's hold M on your keyboard and left click to create a multiply node. And hold S and left click to make a new scalar parameter which we'll call intensity to control our intensity in the material instance. Pipe it into multiply B, the color into multiply A, and all of that into emissive color. Don't forget to save and done. Let's apply our material instance to the custom light bulb we created and double click the instance to open it up. You'll notice the color and intensity parameters on the right based on the parameters we created in our master material. Choose an intensity, choose a color, and have fun. Now the scene is looking, eh, eh, needs some atmosphere. So look at the difference this is about to make. In the place actors window, type exponential height fog and get it all up in your scene. Scroll down to the volumetric fog checkbox and slap it. On film sets, they usually add a bit of fog or atmosphere to achieve this subtle look both indoors and out. So it's no different in our 3D scenes. Let's scroll back up and adjust the fog density slider. Oh, but it caps out at 0.05. We want more, so type in a bigger number and break the rules. It looks nice. And lastly, we're getting weird results in the corner over here, so set the fog in scattering color to black. Perfect. Fixed. Now, this is a live show setting we're creating, and what live show doesn't have awesome visuals to accompany the music? So let me show you how I set up an emissive video screen to play any video you want. Let's make a videos folder and drag an mp4 video file inside. Right click, navigate to media and click new media player. Check the video output media texture asset box. Let's open it up and double click on the video we just dragged in. Save and close. Now you'll notice an underscore video asset was created. If we drag that out onto say a flat plane that can act as a screen, a new master material will be created and automatically apply itself to our plane. Let's double click the master material to make a couple adjustments. You can see that the texture sample node is referencing the media player video we just created and is piped in to the base color. Now, if you want a challenge, pause the video here and set up an intensity parameter for this texture and pipe it into the emissive color. Otherwise, let's create a multiply node by holding M and left clicking and a scalar parameter with S plus left click. We can name that screen brightness and pipe it into multiply B, the texture into multiply A, and the multiply into emissive color. And hey, if you got something close, congratulations. Let's go ahead and save and close. Create a material instance by right clicking our master material and clicking on create material instance. Double click the instance and notice the screen brightness parameter we just set up. But how do we get this video screen to play in our viewport? Because right now it's not. And even if we hit the big play button on the right, and hop into our level, we still get nothing. And plus, I'm not trying to make a playable level. I want to render some nice cinematics. Now, if you're familiar with DaVinci Resolve, Adobe Premiere, or Final Cut, Unreal Engine has something similar built in that allows you to add layers, clips, and anything else you want to edit or animate. It's called the sequencer, and it's crucial for not only exporting sequences, but being able to play back what you're working on. So let's make a sequence. Right click and make a sequence folder. Inside, we'll right click 
go to animation and create a new level sequence. Double click it and let's hop in together. And since our movie screen is the first thing that needs to be queued up and played in our scene, let's right click in our sequence window and make a media track so we can add our media player asset. Now by default, this doesn't fill the entire timeline, so you'll need to drag it out to the end. Now, if you scrub the timeline, you'll notice it's still not playing. So right click your media track, go to properties and choose your media texture video. Now, if you scrub or hit play, things should be working nicely. Open your material instance and adjust the screen brightness too. Now, if you're trying to get this video to play in your real time level, the process is a bit different. There's a tutorial in the description if that's what you need. But to make playback easier, let's toggle the cinematic viewport by clicking perspective in the viewport and choosing cinematic viewport right at the bottom. So now that we have a small scene to work with, let's lock in our camera settings. Ever since I started this channel back in 2006, I've been making live action short films and making my short films look like real movies was and always will be the goal. And I've found that my knowledge of real world cameras actually translates to 3D art. So if you're a 3D or VFX artist and have access to a cheap DSLR or even a cheap 35 millimeter film camera, definitely grab one, start shooting. And I promise you're gonna learn a lot. You can have a lot of fun and all that knowledge will translate into 3D as well. So let's start breaking down these cinematic camera settings in Unreal Engine. In the place actors window, let's search for cine camera actor, drag it out and right click it to pilot the camera. Nowadays, movies are usually filmed in a 235 to one or 239 to one aspect ratio. In other words, they're super widescreen. That specific aspect ratio is usually always wider than the TV screen or computer monitor it's being displayed on, which is why you get empty space above and below the image. These black bars are so crucial to the cinematic look, people are slapping them over anything to look legit. While it's not the end all be all to make your janky iPhone shot cinematic, it can certainly help. So these cinematic bars are achieved by setting your aspect ratio to somewhere between 235 and 239. So with your camera selected, come down to the film back settings, make sure it's set to custom and enter 64 for the width, 27 for the height. And you'll notice the aspect ratio is set to 237, which is perfectly between our two filmic aspect ratio options. But what about depth of field? Let's lock that in. So think of these lens settings here as the boundaries in which our camera can operate. If you're trying to zoom out to a 16 millimeter but can't, it's because you chose a 24 millimeter to 70 millimeter lens to attach to your virtual camera. For the most freedom, go with universal zoom, which gives us the ability to play between four millimeters and a thousand millimeters and stop all the way down to a 1.2. Now, if you know real world lenses, the aperture or f-stop, same thing, is essentially the amount of light that's let into the lens. The more light that's let in, the blurrier your out of focus elements are. So to get that nice blurry background, I keep my minimum f-stop at 1.2, though you can set it to like 0.95 or below if you wanna crank it, it just depends on the shot. To focus on something specific, leave your focus method on manual, check the draw debug focus plane box and work the manual focus distance to find your subject. Or you can set your focus method to tracking, open the tracking focus settings and eye drop anything you want to focus on regardless of where the camera is. So now that we decided our min max camera settings, let's pick something that looks nice, like 50 millimeters with a 1.2 aperture. Nice. But let's improve your depth of field quality with a cheat code. Yes, Unreal Engine has cheat codes to make things a little bit more confusing. <laughs> Just pull your escape key on the top left of your keyboard is the tilde key. Hit that to open up your console command menu. Type r.temporalaa dot upsampling zero. Shout outs to William Falche for this one. He made a whole video going into how and why this looks better, which you can find in the description. Next up, we have frame rate, which is super important to getting that filmic look. Movies operate at a standard 24 frames per second. Since we're making movies, hit the tilde key and type t.maxfps24. This locks your viewport frame rate at 24 frames per second so you can get a feel for your final export. The last thing we'll control in camera is exposure because Unreal defaults to auto exposure and we want manual control over what our exposure does. So to turn off auto exposure, let's click settings, project settings, type exposure and uncheck auto exposure. Let's change auto exposure histogram to manual. Then in our camera settings under post process, let's open exposure and toggle metering mode as well as exposure compensation. And regardless of your metering mode setting, 
you should now be able to adjust the exposure to your liking. Woo! Unreal Engine is a deep program and I have thrown a lot at you so far and we're not done yet. We still gotta talk about export settings. But if y'all are still with me, I just wanna say thank you. Y'all are the ones who really care about this stuff. If you really enjoy this content, consider subscribing. I do a lot of deep dive content like this in the world of 3D, VFX, and storytelling. And if you wanna get your hands on all of my assets, project files, and more, check out my Patreon to see if that's for you. But let's dive back into Unreal Engine because there's still settings we gotta tweak to get the most out of this program. Earlier, we enabled ray tracing, but how do we fine tune its settings to get the cleanest results? One thing you need to know that took me forever to figure out is that your viewport view is just a low res sample of what you'll really be exporting. So no worries if you're like, why doesn't this look 100%? Well, one reason is because you don't have a post-processing volume in your scene where we can control bloom, bokeh shape, color correction, film grain, and most importantly, tweak our graphical settings. Let's drag out a post-process volume from the place actors window. Now by default, it's restricted to this little box, but we wanna tweak the global settings, not just settings for this tiny little area. So with the post-process volume selected, let's search for unbound and toggle infinite extent. By the way, you can hit G to toggle icons on and off if that's helpful for you. All right, so let's drop down lens and work on our bloom settings. You can tick method, intensity, and threshold to fine tune them. Bloom is important because it's a real world camera attribute that occurs when things get really bright in dark areas. The scene would be lame without bloom. And using bloom convolution actually allows you to choose custom bloom shapes by switching out the kernel. But I personally, I didn't go that far with this scene. Next, under image effects, I like to add a little vignette to simulate real world lens vignette, which is actually something you'll see removed from photographs or footage, but I think it can help draw the eye to the center of the frame. But be subtle with this. Grain is another one that you can toggle uh, to dirty up your super clean footage. Now this is so important. So important that I'll actually render without grain so I can add super specific film grain from a pack or something in DaVinci. But if you don't have that option, this is way better than not having any. So add it, but again, be subtle. Motion blur is next. So if we drop down rendering features, we can adjust our motion blur. I like to keep mine film standard, which is technically double your frame rate. In our case, it's 24 FPS, so one over 48 or 180 degrees. In other words, just set your amount to 0.5 and you'll be good in most situations. Now, I love me some crispy reflections and had a heck of a time trying to clean them up. I actually had my DirectX settings on DirectX 11 and my reflections were looking like booty. So Sensei Steve was like, nah man, DirectX 12 if you're trying to enable ray tracing. So open up ray traced reflections in your post process volume and make sure you have enough bounces. Two works for my scene, but if you want to see reflections in reflections in reflections, you'll need to creep that number up to two, three, four bounces, etc., until you're happy. The samples per pixel also makes a huge difference. I'll usually just keep doubling the number until I'm happy with the result or until my frame rate drops significantly, which you can see, by the way, by going to the top left of your viewport and checking show FPS. You can always boost the samples per pixel before export though. So pick something that keeps your frame rate up until then. Now that's all I'm doing as far as post-process settings go. But if I missed anything, please leave a comment down below. I learn stuff from you guys all the time. Now there's two more things I wanna talk about before this video wraps, all right? First is how I captured custom mocap data, brought it into Unreal Engine, and cleaned things up. And the second thing is my final export settings and all the cheat codes I use to push our render beyond what we're seeing in the viewport. So since this is a dance club, we need to get some 3D characters dancing. So that means it's time to bust out the Rococo mocap suit, strap on the gloves, and crank up the jams. Y'all, I danced. I danced my little legs right off. We're talking like 10 minute takes. I do this over and over and over again until I have enough 10 minute takes to fill a dance club. But there's only so much dancing one man can handle, so I recorded a few looping animations as well to fill out the crowd. So to get this custom mocap data out of Rococo and into Unreal, I'll first reprocess using Rococo's awesome filters and export a Mixamo skeleton because I'm about to pair this data with a Mixamo mesh. So on Mixamo, I'll search for T-Pose, then download the characters in T-Pose that I want to attach to the custom mocap data I just recorded. 
So in order to pair any character to any animation, we have to import everything in a specific order. Drag one character FBX into an appropriate folder, which will queue the FBX import options. Now we can leave everything blank, but I gotta point out this use T0 as ref pose checkbox. Now to my knowledge, since the T pose is the entire pose, not just on frame zero, we technically don't need to check this box, but if your FBX is animated with the T pose only on frame zero, then you'll definitely wanna check this box. That way you can pair this character up with other animations. I'll check this though, because it doesn't hurt to, and import. In our characters folder, we see a skeleton was made. This is the asset we'll use for any and all characters and animations we import from here on out. So when I drag a new character in, we'll make sure the skeleton is set to T-Pose James Skeleton. Sharing that skeleton allows us to swap freely between characters and animations. Otherwise, we'd have to do this one by one for like 100 plus characters, and that's just not possible. Now, when we import the custom mocap data, which I'll batch drag and drop, we again want to ensure we're using that same T-Pose James skeleton and import all. So far, so good. But if we compare the base T-Pose character to the animated character, one looks normal and the other looks like Gumby. So let's fix this. Double click the animation data and go to frame one T-Pose. To fix the long neck syndrome, click options just above the bone tree and select show retargeting options. Select all your bones with control A, right click and select recursively set translation retargeting skeleton. Bam, the neck is fixed. But now the character's floating and has these football shoulders. So to fix the floating, just set the hips to animation scaled. To fix these shoulders, drop the shoulder bones by 30 degrees and raise the arm bones by another 30. That balances things out. But if you save and close, these arm changes won't stick. You need to make a keyframe, then hit apply. If you wanna make more tweaks, you certainly can, but for my club scene, the simple neck and shoulders fix will do just fine. And just a final note that you'll need to do this for each unique animation. But now you can change out the character by changing the skeletal mesh, as well as the animation they're performing by ensuring animation mode is set to use animation asset. Now, Winbush's tutorials on character stuff in Unreal Engine really helped me figure out some of this stuff. So definitely look for his channel in the description if you're trying to dive deeper into all of this. And finally, we've come to the last bit of this epic tutorial, export settings. And we're gonna use the movie render queue to control those export settings. The movie render queue says, forget real time, let's crank these settings to get the best looking images possible. In order to get the movie render queue running, we need to enable the plugin by going to settings, plugins, typing movie render, and checking both of these options here. Once you do so, you'll be prompted with a restart. Then you can go to window, cinematics, movie render queue. Let's click the green render button and select our sequence. Now to tweak the export settings, Let's click on unsaved config to open up the settings and presets window. By default, we're exporting a JPEG sequence, but if you want as much control over your image for color correction, say in DaVinci Resolve or Premiere Pro, I would definitely export an EXR sequence and untoggle the JPEG. You can check multi-layer if you want to include other render passes in your EXR as well. Let's add some anti-aliasing as well, which really helps clean up motion blur samples and steppy edges. There's two different kinds of anti-aliasing, but for this project, I'm using 64 temporal samples and checking the override anti-aliasing button. So there is a ton to get into, like how and why all this stuff works, but this video would be two times longer if I dug any deeper than this. So if you want to get into this stuff and really understand all of it, read the documentation for the movie render queue. I got you with a link in the description. It's really well written, easy to understand, and they do a fantastic job of guiding you through each and every detail. And finally, we have console variables, the cheat codes that let you crank your settings on export. Now I got all of these console variables from that documentation link I just mentioned, so check it out so you can copy paste all of this stuff into your projects. So these top five turn off any denoising that occurs while ray tracing is enabled. Already things will be a little more crisp. The next four commands are recommended to be set at zero when we're running our current anti-aliasing settings. And this chunk of console variables are telling the engine to crank motion blur, depth of field, bloom, and tone map settings to their max. Remember when we adjusted our ray traced reflection samples per pixel in our post-process volume? Well, I have that as a console variable as well. 
where we can take this number way higher than it is in our viewport. The final console variable I have for you is r.screen percentage. This one is huge because what it's doing is essentially rendering a higher res version of your image then scaling it back down to your output resolution. So if we're exporting a 1920 by 817, which by the way is that cinematic aspect ratio we went over, r.screen percentage 100 keeps things at default. But if we set r.screen percentage to 200, Unreal will render a 3840 by 1634 image, two times the resolution, but scale that down to fit your original resolution. It improves your sharpness like crazy and is definitely a console variable you don't want to miss out on. And with all that, we finally find ourselves in the output settings. Set your directory, set your resolution, check the box for a custom frame rate of 24 FPS, hit accept, and render your scene. You are all champs for making it this far into this video. It feels so good to finally get a grasp on this program after a year and a half, and I know that you can too. Click the link in the description and download Unreal Engine for free. Whether you're making real-time games or photoreal cinematics, Unreal Engine has something for everybody. And subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on the 10 minute music video that I put together from this project. I also got a couple more deep dive videos before the year's end. So stay excited, stay passionate, and I'll catch y'all later. Peace.